This video will briefly cover options, spot markets, forward contracts, futures contracts, and swap contracts. These instruments are what we cover throughout the course, so I'll briefly introduce them to you so that you become familiar with the concepts that we're going to be working with. We'll also distinguish between risk neutrality and risk aversion in this video. We'll talk about diversifiable risk and market risk. We'll describe short selling, which is an important concept. We'll talk about repurchase agreements, which are repos, and the repo rate, which is an interest rate we'll use throughout the course for discounting cash flows. Then we'll talk about arbitrage and the wall of one price. So now let me move the pencil and paper and we'll talk about call options and put options. Let's start off by covering the most basic type of option out there, a call option. Now a call option is a contract and the holder of that option has the right to buy 100 shares of stock at a specified price, often called the strike price, labeled X, or the exercise price, for a certain period of time. Usually it could be, could be that the option expires tomorrow or it could be you know, nine months from now. Depends on the option. So it has a certain period of time in which that option is alive. And once the option expires, it's dead, it's gone, it doesn't exist anymore. So when you buy and hold a call option, you're bullish on the stock. You expect it to go up because you're going to lock in and pay this X if you exercise. Now let me show you the payoffs associated with such an option. And it'll be helpful to you. Because we're going to use this in, in the next several chapters. We're going to be talking about this concept and these concepts. And this is fundamental to what we're dealing with. Here we have dollars here. And then here we're going to have the stock price, and here is the strike price. Let's say the strike price is $30 on a stock. So we've got stock A, B, C. And let's and the stock price could be anything. It could be anywhere in this area. So if it's over $30, it's up here. If it's under $30, it's here. Now, this has an important point. This is this is where the strike is. Now, since you're bullish on the stock. If the stock goes below $30, let's say the stock price is somewhere here, it could be $29, $28, $25, you're not going to buy the stock at $30. When you can go in the open market, and if it's $27, go and buy it in the open market. You would never want to exercise this option and pay $30 for it. So this option has no payoff. You're not going to exercise it in this time. You're not going to exercise it in this area here when the stock is below the strike. Now, as soon as the stock starts going up and above the strike, for every dollar the stock goes up, you're going to make a dollar profit on a per share basis. And that's important. I'm doing everything on a per share basis. Even though the contract is 100 shares, you know, why multiply everything by 100? It'll just drive you crazy. Do everything in your analysis on a per share basis. And if you want to know the entire position, at the very end, you can multiply everything by 100. So my point is, if the stock is at 32, then you're going to make 30. You're, you're going to make two dollars per share on the stock. If it's at 31, you're going to make a dollar per share in profit. And so here's the payoff. There's no payoff when the stock is below 30 dollars, and as soon as the stock starts going up, it's like a 45 degree angle. It's going to go up, 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 and that's where you make your profits. That's why you're bullish because when the stock goes up you make money. Now that's, ba that's a call option and the way we write this is in this case we say look when S is is less than X it's out of the money. Meaning right here it's out of the money in this area and when you're right at this point at X when the stock price is at 30 then S equals X it's at the money and I'll just use a dollar sign for at the money. And when you're in this area here, see how I denote this here, if the stock price is above the strike, then you're in the money. Okay, so you want to buy options that eventually become in the money so you make some profit. So we'll be looking at these options and we'll have to figure out, well, what is the price of the option? What's it worth today? And what's it, it, what it is worth today depends on 
where the stock price is relative to the strike, how volatile the stock is, meaning how, how much does it oscillate back and forth this way? If the stock, the underlying stock, and that's what this is called, an underlying asset, because remember, derivatives, derivatives derive their value from an underlying asset. And for a call option, which is a derivative, the underlying asset is the stock of this ABC company. And so if the underlying stock gyrates back and forth, then this option is more valuable. That's because it can go way into the money, deep into the market, into the money, as we would say, and be way out here. And so if you can time that exercise, you'll be lucky. Now, if you, time, you don't want to time the exercise and exercise it when it's down here because it doesn't make any sense to exercise. You just let it expire worthless. So when an option is down here at expiration, below the strike, it expires worthless. So much of this course is about, well, how do you determine what the value of this call option is? How do you determine it? How do you price it? And then we have a couple of chapters on that, on that material. So now that you have the basic idea of what a call option is, let's look at a put option. So a put option, gives the holder the right, but not the obligation, to sell 100 shares of stock at a specified price known as the strike for a certain period of time at which case it expires. And so when you buy a put and you hold a put option, you are bearish. You expect the, drop, the stock to drop in value. So here's the stock price. Here's the strike. Let's say it's $30 again. Same stock could be ABC stock and we have a strike of 30. So for every dollar the stock drops below 30, you're gonna make a dollar in profit. So this will be a 45 degree line. So you'll make a dollar. If this goes to 29, you'll make a dollar payoff. Now, if the stock goes above 30, the payoff here is going to be zero. The option is out of the money it's at the money when the stock price is at the strike. And now it's in the money when the stock drops. So that's why you want a put option when you expect the stock to fall in value. That's where you make your money. So you, right away you see how flexible these things are. Calls are, calls mean you're bullish on the market. A put means you're bearish. In other words, you expect the stock to drop. Now what's important to realize is, that look, stock ABC could be trading on the New York Stock Exchange. And it's trading on the New York Stock Exchange. And these options markets, which are often conducted in the Chicago Board of Options Exchange, are completely independent of each other in a sense. So a put is a derivative that derives its value on an underlying stock, stock ABC. But these option contracts trade in Chicago. The New York Stock Exchange is trading the stock. The stock is just doing what it does like any other typical common stock. And people who are interested in trading derivatives set up contracts to trade on the Chicago Board of Options Exchange. And these things are standardized contracts, as we'll see later on. But that's basically the structure of what a call and a put is. Now, what I showed you so far is a call and a put from the holder's perspective. You, you know, you basically bought the option. What we'll cover in later chapters is Oh, uh, where did you buy the option from? Yeah, you bought the option. Somebody had to sell it to you, and whoever sold it to you must have had the opposite position on it, or the opposite thought in a sense, right? Because think about it. If you buy a stock, you're bullish on the stock. Expect it to go up. Well, whoever sold it to you must have thought the stock was going to go down. And so they have a negative position in a sense on it. So my point again is that if you buy a call option, you are bullish on the underlying stock. And if you sell the call option, you are bearish on the underlying stock. You expect the underlying stock to fall. So it's important to realize that these are the holder's perspective or people who buy puts and calls. But there's another side to it. And we'll cover that in a later chapter. Okay, now let's cover what's called spot forward and futures contracts. So let's look, look at a spot market or spot prices, spot, S-P-O-T. So nearly all transactions, except maybe credit cards, 
or spot transactions. You go to the supermarket, you buy a pound of sugar, and you pay for it in cash. And so the money goes in one direction and the sugar goes in the other. You hand money over to the cash cashier and you walk out with the sugar. That's on the spot. Nobody really calls it, the call, calls it the spot market or what we sometimes we call the cash market unless you're talking about the derivatives market and you're thinking about forward and future prices. So let's look at a forward contract. And then we'll see, well, there's a forward price associated with forward contracts. A forward contract is an agreement that's negotiated between two parties for the delivery of a physical asset or a financial asset at a certain period in time in the future. And that future will be at expiration. So what you're doing is when you enter into a forward contract, and notice carefully my language, I'm saying when you enter into a forward contract at this point, no money changes hands, no commodity changes hands. It's not like this transaction where the sugar and the money moved exactly at the same time right there on the spot. Here you enter into a forward contract and then if the contract expires let's say in nine months that's when the money and the commodity changes hands. So basically you lock into a futures price, oh I'm sorry, you lock into a forward price, a price that you're going to see in the future. And so you enter into this contract, you negotiate the contract for the size, like for example, how many pounds of sugar you want to buy, and, and the expiration date, and then somebody goes and figures out, you know, well, what exactly, you know, you scratch your head, exactly what do you think the price of sugar is going to be in the future? So when you're in the spot market, you're used to supply and demand, so you got demand, and you got supply, and you got a price, and you got a quantity, and that's how we model things in economics with supply and demand. Well, that's for the market right here, right now. It's the cash market. Although, like I said, nobody calls it that. It's just the market. But people here, they have to think, well, what does the supply and demand look like nine months from now? Because that's going to help determine this price, the forward price. So these are contracts that you can... can you can enter into and consider and so you get into this contract you're locked into this contract for nine months you can renegotiate your way out of it uh, but other than that you're going to have to buy this commodity like sugar or by the way when you like i said before if you buy it somebody's going to sell it to you so somebody's on the other side of this transaction so somebody could be selling it to you and the point is the money and the sugar are going to change hands at this point in time, whether you're long or short. So long means you're going to buy it in nine months, and short means you're entered into the forward contract to sell sugar in nine months. If your house is heated by home heating oil, then you often will get a contract in the mail from your home heating oil company asking you, do you want to lock in a price of oil for the winter? And that's basically a forward contract in the sense that, you know, it, you're, you're locking it in, say, over a certain period of time, and you're locking in a certain price for oil. And you're going to be buying that oil uh, over the time period. And so it's like a series of these forward contracts that you're going to enter into where you buy the oil and you lock in. So you get rid of your risk because, you know, the price of oil could go way up and it could hurt you. But then again, the price of oil could drop significantly, but you're locked in to pay it, and that's going to hurt you. Now, if you're the seller, you're the oil company. Well, the oil company is the one that's going to deliver the oil and sell the oil. And so whatever you gain will be their loss, and whatever their loss is is your gain. It's basically a zero-sum game. Now, compare this this obligation I mean you're obligated to actually take delivery and pay for it if you're the, if you're long the position but remember with options you have the optionality you don't have to exercise it and you can just let the option expire you don't have the ability to let these contracts expire forward contracts you're obligated to take delivery if you're long the position 
and you're obligated to deliver the item, for example, sugar, in nine months if you're short the contract. So if you're long the contract, you hope the price goes up, and if you're short the contract, you hope the price goes down. Now, let's compare forward contracts with futures contracts. Futures contracts are basically the same thing mechanically. But futures contracts are highly standardized contracts. Where remember, I said these are negotiated. So the time period is negotiated. The, what's actually called for delivery, you know, how many pounds of sugar is negotiated and where it's going to be delivered is negotiated. But with futures contracts, it's highly standardized. It's going to be, for example, a contract of size 112,000 pounds. And so these are, these are wholesale level contracts. These are not contracts for a few pounds, but uh, they're typically done for, for companies that are in the business of dealing with, for example, sugar. And so with futures contracts, the contract size, the standard contract size is 112,000 pounds. There are in the contracts certain places where you can deliver that, that sugar, and the sugar has to be a certain number, you know, a certain quality. It can't, it's going to have to be inspected to make sure it meets that quality. And so that's why these are highly standardized contracts. And when you have standardized contracts, it's easy to trade them back and forth. So these things trade on a futures exchange, and there's thousands of contracts trade per day in various commodities and financial contracts. And even stocks have futures contracts on them. So they're quite prevalent. And we'll be talking a lot about these futures contracts. And these futures contracts have a futures price. Just like a forward contract has a forward price, a futures contract has a futures price. And you're obligated to fulfill this contract. So if you go long, you're going to enter into a contract, enter into a contract. You're not going to buy the underlying commodity, although... Boy, keep in mind that I, and often the textbook will talk about, you're, you're, you bought a futures contract. It's really slang for the fact that you entered into a futures contract today to take possession of sugar, let's just say in, nine, in eight months from now. And so you enter into the contract here, no money changes hands. The contract goes through eight months later, you're going to have to buy the sugar for the price that you contracted for right here. And so you're going to take delivery of the sugar and you're going to give up cash. That's what a futures contract, a long position in a futures contract is. The party on the other side, sometimes called a counterparty, will deliver the sugar and accept cash payment. They hope the price drops down because they would love to sell sugar Let's say they sell sugar at a um, dollar a pound here. They'd love to see the price of sugar drop to 75 cents a pound because now that sugar is worth 75 cents a pound eight months from now. But they locked in and sold it for a dollar. So they just made 25 cents per pound at this point in time. So when you lock into a futures price or a forward price, at these points in time, you're anticipating what's going to happen. You're really anticipating what's happening to supply and demand in the future. Because if there's a hurricane or some type of problem uh, or, or import export problems, then the price of sugar is going to gyrate up and down. And you don't really know which, way, which direction it's going in. So you enter into forward and futures to get rid of risk. And so again, these contracts, their derivatives because they derive their underlying value based on an underlying, like sugar in this example. Okay, now let's go into swaps, swap contracts. Okay, a swap is an agreement between two parties to exchange a series of cash flows over time in the future. And so what makes them different here is it's basically a, a series of forward or futures contracts. So you enter into a swap at this point in time, and let's just make it annual for sake, for, e for ease of computation here. And so what happens is you enter into a swap here, and then you start exchanging cash flows 
at various points in time. And a good example of that is an interest rate swap or what's called a plain vanilla interest rate swap. And so in an interest rate swap, you're exchanging a fixed interest rate for a floating interest rate. Now, what does that mean? Well, I've mapped out a timeline. It's very convenient to show these cash flows in a timeline. So you may be on the position that you, you think interest rates are going to go up. So you want to receive a floating rate, okay? a rate that varies. It could be, for example, like a, an interest rate based on treasury bills, or it could be based on LIBOR, the London International Bank Offering Rate, or some reference rate. So if you're going to receive a floating payment, there's an interest rate associated with that, some index that you're going to have to track. And it could be that, you know, the index you project to be 2% here, and you expect it to be 3% here, and maybe you expect it to be 4%, 3%. So you have these expectations of where interest rates are going to go for this particular floating reference point. Okay, so it could be, for example, treasury bills. You expect in one year treasury bills would be 2%, then 3%, then 4 then 3% then again. So that's the floating rate. And notice it, it goes up. So you want to receive a floating rate because you're receiving more money than what you're going to pay. And so, so you're going to pay, say, a fixed rate. And you're entering into this contract, this swap contract at this point in time. And let's say you're going to pay 2%. So notice the positive sign means that's what you're going to receive in cash flow. The negative sign is what you're going to pay. So you're going to pay this negative 2% the whole time. So you're swapping, floating, and fixed. You're going to get floating. You're going to pay fixed. And so you're going to net each of these payments out. These interest rates are going to get netted out each time period. So in this case, the interest rates are the same. So there's no cash payment on a net basis. You're not gonna pay 2% or receive 2% then pay 2%. They net it out, there's a netting agreement. So no money changes hand. But there's another thing you gotta keep in mind is you just can't swap 2% rates. You can't write a check out for 2% and send it to somebody. It's gotta have what's called a notional value. So swaps may have, for example, a $1 million notional value, Let's, as an example. And say, so, okay, it's 2% on 2 million. And then also you got to figure out the time frame. Okay, so in this example, I'm just doing annual for simplicity's sake. Sometimes these things are quarterly, sometimes they're every six months. But this, but this payment is going to be $1 million, what's called the notional value of this swap, times uh, 2%, 0.02, minus 0.02, times... And we often use, and you'll see these conventions that are kind of strange, a 360-day time period. And so it's 360 divided by 360. It's basically one year is what that's telling you, one year. And so the net cash flow that you're going to exchange is going to be zero. Now, when the next year turns around, and let's say the interest rate actually turns out to be what you thought it would be at 3%, then you're going to calculate this cash flow. 0.03 minus 0.02 times 360 over 360, and you're going to get 10, oops, $10,000. You're going to receive net in this case. So this will be $10,000. This will be a 20,000 payment, and this will be another 10,000. And if it flipped the other way and it went to 1% here, and this is still minus 2%, you're going to be paying 10,000 at this point in the fifth period. So swaps can go with you or against you when you enter into these swaps. And so if you're receiving floating and paying a fixed rate, there's somebody on the other side of this swap, what's called a counterparty, that's paying floating and receiving the fixed. And so that's important. So what I want to do is give you an example of how a, sw a swap may actually work, a plain vanilla interest rate swap. And then I'll schematically show you how the cash flows move. So this is really good outline of how the cash flows work. 
This is what you receive, this is what you pay, and you can see each and every period what it's worth. Now, this is a notional value here. It's not the value of the swap. The value of the swap is what you project these cash flows to be discounted back to a present value. So this swap could be worth very little money overall because you're netting out most of the ca you're netting out the cash flows. So when you first enter a swap, if it's a fair swap, the this this fixed rate is basically an average of all these floating rates. The value of the swap when you first enter, it's going to be about zero. Even though it has a million dollar notional value, that notional value is just designed to calculate the interest payments. So now let's move on to an example of a swap and you can see where financial engineering comes about because you can rearrange the financial structure of a company using swaps. Okay, so let me give you an example of a swap. Okay, it's a little involved, so let me explain it and then I'll draw it out schematically. So let's say we have counterparty A. Counterparty A five years ago issued a 10-year fixed rate bond and now wants to pay floating as it expects interest rates to fall. So A contacts a swap dealer to find a counterparty, somebody who wants to pay fixed and receive floating. So A, counterparty A, wants to pay floating and receive fixed interest rate payments. Why do they want to pay floating? Because they expect interest rates to fall. Counterparty A had issued bonds to its bondholders to finance its company, part of its capital structure, and it's paying a fixed rate, but it wants to enter into this swap so it pays floating and receive fixed. Now, if interest rates fall, as A projects, it's going to make some money on that because it's going to pay the small floating rate and receive a fixed rate that says fixed. Now, there's a counterparty B that the swap dealer is going to contract. So when you enter into a swap contract, you got to find somebody who makes a market in swaps. And so you contract the swap dealer, which is probably a part of a big bank. And the swap dealer is going to found, find the counterparty that wants to receive floating and pay fixed. So there's two counterparties. One's going to pay floating and receive fixed. The other, B, wants to receive floating and pay fixed. Now, why would B want to do that? Well, B has an opposite position in the market. B thinks interest rates are going to go up, so it wants to receive this floating interest rate and lock in and pay a fixed amount here. So they're going to swap these, they're going to swap these cash flows, okay? So now I could show it to you with a timeline, but there's another way that to show it, and that's schematically. Now, before we go further, let's we got to make a, we got to come up with a floating. The floating rate is going to be LIBOR plus one percent, and that's pretty standard that you use LIBOR or some other floating interest rate. Now, LIBOR is the London International Bank offering rate. And it's an interest rate on euro dollar deposits. It's basically CDs in another country denominated in dollars. So you can actually deposit dollars in England, for example, and earn an interest rate that's based on those dollars, even though you're in England where they have pounds. So even though LIBOR is based on euro dollar deposit rates, it's a very commonly used interest rate in the United States. So you have LIBOR, London International Bank Offering Rate. It's a flexible rate. It's kind of like a treasury bill rate, sort of, plus a fixed 1% on top of it. So this is the floating rate, and that floating rate will go up or down over time. Every day there's transactions going. In fact, every minute there's transactions going on in this market to drive the interest rate up or down. So it's you know random in a sense. And so let's say the fixed rate that they decide to agree on is 6%. So what that means is, look, over the time period in which they're going to be swapping these cash flows, the average LIBOR plus 1% is going to be about 6%. And the fixed rate is 6% because it's basically an average of what this will be. If that's the case, then on average, 
The fixed rate is 6%. The floating rate is 6%. LIBOR plus 1 is 6%. Then the value of the swap when you first enter, it's going to be basically zero because it's all going to average out over time. But you know things will not average out unless it's a total coincidence. Things are not going to average out. Either LIBOR is going to go up or it's going to go down, and this thing is going to be, so to speak, in the money or out of the money, depending on which party you are. So let's... let's um, diagram this out. So here we got A and here we have B. Now A already has locked in as we said. Ten years ago they started paying a 5%. They, they'd issued a bond and started paying 5% on fixed to A's bondholders. So ten years ago A issued these bonds and they're paying a fixed coupon of 5% to bond, A's bondholders. Now you got counterparty A, you got counterparty B, and always in the middle is a swap dealer. Swap dealer is going to handle the, the payments that go back and forth between A and B over time. And you know, the swap dealer is not in it for nothing. They're going to make a profit on this. And so what, what the swap dealer here is, let's say the swap dealer wants a half a percent wants to skim a half a percent off the cash flows. And let's see what those cash flows would look like. Well, pay, a, a wants to pay floating, so it's going to pay this LIBOR plus 1%. And it's going to go through the swap dealer who will end up paying it to B. And so that's what's happening. So A pays LIBOR, pays this floating rate plus 1%, and it's going to go to B, but it's going to be LIBOR plus a half a percent because the swap deal is going to skim a half a percent off of this payment. And then B is going to pay the fixed amount of 6%, and that'll get right over, transferred right over to A. So schematically, this is what's happening. Money's going in one direction, another direction, one direction, and another direction. And it effectively nets out minus this half a percent that the swap dealer is skimming off the top, so to speak, of these cash flows. It could skim the cash flows, could skim this half a percent off the fixed rate. It could skim it off the floating or a combination of the two. There's also various fees associated with just entering into the swap itself. So um, we often abstract from that because it just muddies the water. But here I just wanted to show you that there's a payment involved, that the swap dealer doesn't do this for nothing. So that's basically schematically how a swap works and then you're going to, to, to figure out how to value a swap we're going to use timelines now before we go any further let's make an observation look what happened to both a and b's balance sheet so to speak so a was paying a fixed rate now it's paying a floating rate it's as though it's as though A changed its capital structure. Remember what capital structure is, is you know how much debt you have, how much equity you have, and then you know is the debt variable or is it fixed? Well, basically what happened was A now swapped its fixed and got floating in terms of its payments. And what that means is it's as though A bought back its fixed rate bonds and issued floating rate bonds. Now, do you know how expensive that would be or for counterparty A to buy its own bonds back, billions of dollars of bonds, buy them back, and then issue new bonds that are floating? It would probably be very, very costly. All of that structure is still there on the balance sheet. It still has fixed bonds that it's paying out as a liability on its balance sheet. That hasn't changed. What A did was it overlaid a swap on top of its balance sheet and effectively changed its capital structure, meaning it, it was paying fixed and now it's paying floating. Now in the problem, I didn't really talk about the capital structure of B, but the same thing is happening. B basically changes capital structure in terms of what it's paying in terms of a variable rate. Now it's going to be paying a fixed rate. Now let's talk about risk aversion and risk premiums. RP, risk premiums. So in this course, 
And in much of finance, we assume people are risk adverse. But you know, there's this trick that we're going to use later on in the course to value options contracts and futures contracts. And often what we'll assume is we'll assume risk neutrality. And so let me explain the difference between risk aversion and risk neutrality. If you're risk neutral, you don't really care about risk. All you care about is the payoff. So you're not worried about risk. You, you, you demand no risk premium, no extra money for entering into a contract if you're risk neutral. If you're risk adverse and you start taking on risk, you're not only worried about the, the payment, but how risky the payment will be in the future. You know, think of it as a normal distribution. You could expect to receive a dollar in a couple of months, but you know, it could be more than a dollar, it could be less than a dollar, in which case you're taking risk. Well, if you're taking risk and you're risk adverse, you're not gonna deal with this type of situation unless you can earn a premium for, the for, for taking that risk and possibly losing. So you hope to earn this risk premium, but it's that risk in a sense. So when you're risk adverse, you're gonna discount various securities that are highly risky. They're not worth that much if they're super risky. And if, they're, and if you have no risk aversion and you're risk neutral, you're not gonna discount at all. You're not gonna earn a risk premium. You don't demand the risk premium because you don't even care about risk. So let me give you a setup here. Let's assume we're sitting right here today and you can enter a bet where you get $10 if, um, if a coin comes out heads and there's a 50% and there's a 50% chance that you'll win $5, you'll win $5 if it comes up a tail. So it's 50-50, the weights add up to one or 100% of all the probabilities are laid out. $10 if it's a head, $5 if it's a tail. Now, how much would you pay for this transaction, for this bet, so to speak? Well, some people would say, well, it's simply a weighted average of these two cash flows, of these payoffs. These are payoffs to a, a coin flip. And so if you figure this out, it's 750. Some people would say, well, I'd pay 750 for this transaction, for this bet. And I'd say to you, well, okay, you would do that, but that means you're risk neutral because you're literally paying the expected value. There's risk involved. You're gonna pay 750 and you could end up with just $5, in which case you're gonna lose 250. Or you could gain 250. There's risk. If you're risk adverse, you're gonna want a risk premium associated with that. So you're not gonna to wanna to pay 750 to enter this bet. You'll pay something like, and it depends on how risk adverse you are. Let's say it's 75, 675 is what you decide to pay. You just discounted this by 75 cents based on your risk. Now, if you're even more risk adverse, you may discount it to $6 or even less. So what you're asking for is a risk premium in this bet. And the risk premium is going to be the difference here, 75 cents divided by the 675 that you paid. And that's basically 11.1% risk premium that you expect to earn. So you're gonna plop down 675 and you hope to earn a, a risk premium of 11.1% to enter this bet. And that's just another way of saying, look, I'm discounting this bet and I hope to earn this, and I wanna earn this risk premium associated with it at 11% because I'm taking risk. So if you drop it even lower, then you're gonna make an even higher risk premium. Now, let me ask you this. What if you dropped it to $4? So you say, nah, I'm really risk adverse and I'm going to pay $4 for this bet. Okay, okay. Well, what do you think is going to happen there? Well, nothing is going to happen there because one of the important things that you have to realize is not just from the person who's taking this bet, but there's another side of the transaction you always have to consider. Nobody is going to accept $4, and no matter what happens, they're gonna pay five or 10, at least five. That's a crazy bet, that's an irrational bet. The only person that might take that is somebody who, who we would call risk-loving, or in other words, a gambler might take on that bet. We're going, we're going to assume that they don't exist. We're not gonna deal with gambling. 
and the psychological issues associated with that. But keep in mind, if you're rational, you would never be on the other side of this bet except $4 so that no matter what, you're going to pay at least five out and possibly 10. So my point here is that, okay, there's risk aversion, there's risk premiums, and you can figure these things out. But always keep in mind that there's another side to the transaction. And it's got to make sense to the other side because they're assumed to be a rational party and involved in these transactions. Okay, so now what we want to cover is the concept of return and risk. Something you should be familiar with from a previous finance course. And remember what risk is. Risk is basically un the uncertainty of future returns. You don't know what future returns were going to be, and a good way to just to think about those is, look, you have an expectation. Ah, let's pick $2 this time. You expect to receive $2 or you know, maybe a 10% return, but it could be higher, it could be lower. You're taking on risk. And so your expected return needs to reflect that risk. Okay, That return should include a risk premium if that's the case. So here's what we want to do. Let's take a look at this. And we're going to plot out what's called systemic risk here. Because systemic risk is the risk you take with respect to a well-diversified portfolio. For example, like you, you buy into the S&P 500 and you have a well-diversified portfolio, you have what's called beta risk systemic risk, risk that you can't get rid of under normal circumstances until you enter this course. And I'm going to show you how to get rid of systematic risk. So systematic risk is, is if all you have is stocks and bonds, you're going to be subject to systemic risk. And it's really hard to get rid of it. You can't really get rid of it with just stocks other than to what well, I'm going to show you in a minute, short selling. So it's kind of hard to get rid of it, but when you have a derivatives, options, futures, forward contracts, and swaps, you can get rid of systematic risk and rearrange the risk to whatever you want it to be. And that's the point of this course. You could have learned financial engineering, but before we do anything about financial engineering, we need to first understand the basics of what you're kind of stuck with if you just stick with the stock market. So remember the capital asset pricing model called the CAPM. Basically said this. You got an expected return here and here is your risk-free rate. So that's what we're going to call this, the risk-free rates, the repo rate, which I'll describe in a few minutes in this video. And here we have systemic risk. You have zero systemic risk like a t treasury bill. Treasury bill has no systemic risk. And what do I mean by systemic risk? I mean, basically, how does this, here's the stock market, say the S&P 500, a well-diversified portfolio. It's a stock index, which is an average of 500 stocks. And you know, the S&P goes up, it goes down. And then the question is, well, if you have a stock, how does it move relative to the market? Okay. That's the measure of systemic risk. How does it move relative to the market? It's called covariance, as we'll cover later on in the course. And you may have recall hearing that term in a previous finance course. It's called covariance. So really what you're doing is you're benching the risk of a stock against the market as a whole. That's what this model does. And that's what we measure as systemic risk, systematic risk. And so we have this relationship that if you own a treasury bill, well, the treasury bill basically has a return that does this. It's risk-free, and you know exactly what you're going to get. So if you look at how does this covary, the covariance between this is zero. It's uncorrelated with the market because no matter what the market does, the return is going to be this flat line, maybe 1% for a treasury bill. So it has zero systemic risk, and you have zero risk. You're right here with a 1% return. And as you take systemic risk on, you expect a higher rate of return because you're taking on risk that's really hard to get rid of in the stock market and just using the stock market. Okay. So now with this in mind, let's say we pick a particular stock and you have a particular stock. It has a beta S 
and I'll just say, look, maybe the beta is 1.20. The beta of the market is defined to be one because how does the market co-vary with the market? It has a beta of one. It has the same systematic risk. Stocks that have beta greater than one, like one point, oops, 1.20, get that dollar sign out of there. That's a mistake. Uh, say a stock with a beta of 1.2 is 20% more systemic risk than the market as a whole. And if you had something with a beta of 0.80, it means it's 20% less risk than the market. And a beta stock with a beta of one is basically the same risk as the market as a whole. And so you'd be right here. So what you do is, if in this case, this particular stock, the beta of stock S, we come up, we come over, and this is the expected return on stock S. And this could be, you know, 12%. And if that's 12%, then this is a risk premium. And we're going to label it here. The text is labeling it is with this symbol here. And that's going to be 11%. Okay? So if you didn't want any risk and you bought a T-bill, you'd earn 1%. If you enter into the stock market and buy this particular stock with this systemic risk, co-varies with the market this a bit more. It's more riskier than the market by 20%. You come up, you come over, and let them just making up a number saying, look, it's going to be 12% expected return. This is going to be an 11% risk premium because all you're doing is you're getting 11% for taking on the risk associated with this stock. If you bought a stock that had less risk, come down, you come up, you come over, you're going to get an expected return lower, you're going to earn a much lower risk premium in this example. Okay, so now what's the formula for this? Well, the formula for calculating it comes from the capital asset pricing model. And this is, by the way, called the security market line, if you recall. You have the expected return on the stock equals the risk-free rate, the opportunity cost of money, and that's an important concept. This is the repo rate, basically, that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Then you have beta of the stock, which measures the quantity of systemic risk. See, it's 1.2, it's 20% more than the market, it's the quantity of systemic risk, multiplied by the market risk premium. And this is how much more you expect to earn over the risk-free rate for the market. And since this is the beta of the market, beta M, see that's beta M, you come up, you come over, let me write it in a different color here, right here, see this amount right here? That's the expected return on the market. So if the market is 10%, I'm just making up numbers here, you're going to make 9% here. And if you have a beta 1.20, let's say the risk-free rate's 1%, then you're going to have, this will be 10%, so 10 minus 1 is 9, multiplied by the 1.20 plus 1, you're going to have an expected return for this stock. This right here will be 10.8 plus 1 will give you an 11.8% return for this particular stock. 10.8% of the return is coming from the risk, the risk premium associated with this stock it covers you for risk. Now, interest rates in the market were 1%, so that covers your opportunity cost of money because when you put money into the stock market, you have to take it out of an account, a bank account that earns 1%. And so it's the sum of those two that give you the rate of return, the expected rate of return on your stock, and it gives you two components. So keep that in mind. We're going to be looking at systemic risk, which is risk that you can't diversify in the stock market. You can't get rid of it through diversification. Okay? Now, there's another type of risk called diversifiable risk. And diversifiable risk means, well, you can diversify it away and have no risk at all. Get rid of it completely. And so you just need to keep that in mind. And if when we go through the course, we talk about systemic risk or unsystemic or diversifiable risk. There's two different elements there that you need to separate. So diversifiable risk is sometimes called company-specific risk that you can get rid of through diversifying and having a well-diversified portfolio. Where systemic risk, you can't get rid of it with stocks and diversification. The way to get rid of it is 
you can enter into various derivative positions and offset that systemic risk. Now let's talk about short selling and we'll compare and contrast it to going long a stock. So when you go long a stock, you're bullish. You expect the stock to go up. So when you buy a stock, you're long, you're bullish. When you short a stock, you expect the stock to go down, you are bearish. And these are terms I'm going to use frequently throughout this course. Bullish and bearish, long and short. And so what we want to do is we want to compare and contrast going long and short. And what I like to do is show you using a graph how it works. Because you may not be familiar with it. Because, you know, if you buy a stock, how would you graph the profit on that per share? So we're going to do it on a per share basis. If you buy a stock, it's at $50.00. So here's the stock pricing, it can go above 50, it can go below 50. And here we're gonna have just a zero line and here will be negative. So if you buy a stock and it stays at 50, you made no profit. But if the stock goes up a dollar to 51, you're gonna make a dollar. This will be a dollar right here. You'll make a dollar per share. That's a one right, there's a one right there. And if it goes down to 49, you're gonna lose a dollar. Whoops, lose one dollar. Okay. So what happens is you're going to have a line that's a 45 de at a 45 degree angle. And it's basically a long position. That's how you'd graph the profit of a long stock. It pretty much makes sense. So when you're long, you're going to make money. And so you're obviously you're bullish. You'd never go long if you expect the stock to fall because then you lose money. So you're long, you're bullish, you expect the stock to go up. Everybody knows this. Um, it's the foundation for for most investors. But you know, there's a way to make money when the stock drops. That's short selling. And when you short sell a stock, what you end up doing is you end up getting a position that looks like this when you're short. So if you short a stock at 50, you're gonna make money when the stock drops. So if the stock drops to 49, you're gonna make a dollar. Ooh, but if the stock goes up, the 51, you're going to lose a dollar here. You're going to lose that dollar. So this is the payoff, or the profit, I should say. This is the profit for a short stock. You're going to make money when the stock drops. Now, how does that actually work? Well, it works like this. You tell your broker you want to short a stock, and what they're going to do is they're going to give you shares. They're going to borrow the shares out of either an account or they're going to borrow it in the market. They're going to borrow their shares and, and allow you to sell those shares. Now, the, the broker's going to have complete control over the transaction, but you're orchestrating it because you're the investor, so to speak. So you're going to short the stock at 50, and that means you're going to sell the stock that you borrowed, and you're going to sell it, and you're going to collect $50 in proceeds because you sold the stock to some third party out there. And what you hope to happen is you hope the stock drops in value. Because if it drops in value, what's going to happen is you're going to buy the stock back at a later point in time. And you're going to buy the shares back and your broker's going to get those shares and return them to whoever you borrowed the shares from. But the point is you sold the stock high at 50 and bought it back at a lower price. You made a profit. Yeah, but it's reverse chronological order. It's a bit harder to wrap your head around it. You can actually borrow shares, sell it, and make a profit. But that's how the, the market works. The market is designed to do that. So many students have trouble with shorting a stock. It's like, well, how can you borrow shares and then sell them? Well, it's, it's kind of like, you know, when you go to a bank, this is what I like to tell students. You go to a bank, you take a crisp $100 bill in, you look at the serial number, take it to the bank, you deposit it. Right? Do you think you're going to actually get that $100 back, say, in a year from now? You want to withdraw 100 bucks? You think you're going to get that exact dollar back? No. You're not even going to look at the serial number. You're not going to get that exact bill back. Now, what do you think the bank's going to do with that bill? Do you think it's just going to sit on that money and do nothing with it? Hmm. It's going to lend that money out, right? It's going to lend it out. And then... Hopefully, the, whoever borrows that money pays it back, and uh, you'll have the money available. And even if the company doesn't pay it back, the, the bank is FDIC insured. The bank has profitability, you know, has plenty of capital, 
it can make up that loss. So even if the borrower doesn't pay back the cash, you're still going to be made whole. So you come back at one year later, you're going to get a $100 bill back, maybe a little bit of interest on top of it. But there is an example of, look, you put something into a bank account, the bank lent it out. It went somewhere. Somebody bought a car with it, maybe, or built an addition onto their house. So shorting a stock is no different. This is conceptually a little bit harder because it's a stock instead of actual cash. But it's the same type of concept. Okay, so now let's talk about arbitrage. Very important concept in this course. And for our purposes, arbitrage is the ability to generate a riskless profit with a zero investment. Now think about that for a second. The ability to generate a riskless profit. There's no risk and there's no money down. So there's zero investment. If there's an arbitrage situation, you can make a riskless profit and put no money down. In the financial markets, for an arbitrage situation to occur and exist doesn't make sense because there's going to be people out there called arbitrageurs who are going to try to take advantage of the mispricing. And if something is overvalued, they're going to sell it, drive the price down, and buy something that's undervalued in its place, push the price up until the prices equate. And so what we're doing is when we do arbitrage, we're usually pitting two stocks or two securities against each other in order to price them. So you can use the concept of arbitrage to find mispriced securities or derive the prices of other assets using assets. In fact, in another couple of chapters, we're going to take a long stock and put it up against a written or short call in order to price the call option. Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. So we're going to pit those two against each other and figure out what the value of a call option is. Yeah, it's kind of strange, but let me continue here. Arbitrage opportunities occur when there is at least one of the following three conditions are met. So you need one of these conditions in order to make a profit. And the first condition is the same asset does not trade for the same price on all markets. A really good example that can hit home what if you could buy a prescription drug called XYZ in Canada and a standard prescription for 30 days runs $30. But in the US, the same drug XYZ sells for $300. Now assume the drug is off patent so we don't have to worry about any patent infringement going on. Now in that situation, there's legal ramifications for you to import and export drugs. But assume there was no there was no regulations around it. So you could go to Canada and buy the prescription for 30 days for $30 instead of buying it for $300 in the US. Hmm. Well, if that was the situation, there was no regulations around you doing that, what do you think would happen? Well, people will be buying it in Canada by the tons take it back to the U.S. and sell it at a higher price. So what's going to happen? In Canada, the price of that prescription drug is going to go up based on high demand relative to supply. And then in the U.S., there's going to be an increase in supply dramatically. The price is going to come down. And so that price of that drug is going to equalize across borders, especially if you have drug retailers trying to take advantage of that price differential for a profit. Well, if that could happen, and the prices would equalize, and eventually there'd be no arbitrage profit to be made. That's what we mean by the same asset does not trade for the same price on all markets. So you could say asset or a good, for example, or a commodity or even a drug. And then another condition would be if two different assets with identical cash flows do not trade at the same price. Well, if you have two bonds that are identical and they have the same cash flows, they should be valued at the same price. If you have two stocks that have the same cash flows, they should have the same price if they have the same risk. And so there's two different assets with identical cash flows over time. And if they don't trade at the same price, then you're going to have an arbitrage opportunity. The third condition would be an asset 
with a known price in the future does not trade at its present value. And in that case, there's an arbitrage situation. So with items one and two, in other words, the same asset does not trade for the same price on all markets or two different assets with identical cash flows do not trade at the same price. There's a violation, what's called the law of one price. Goods and assets, including financial assets, should trade at one price. If you ignore any regulations, taxes, restrictions, exchange rate risk, in a, what we sometimes call a perfect market, and there's no costs to doing that, and that's what often what we assume in this course is, we'll often, but not always, assume a perfect market, so we abstract from taxes, transactions, costs. It's just kind of muddy the water in doing the calculations. And so the law of one price is based on a perfect market. But even then, you know, you know, my, my example of a $30 prescription versus 300, well, you know, you may have slight differences in taxes, but not that much. You'll have some transactions costs, but not that much. I would think that even with exchange rate risk, you'd still have an arbitrage opportunity for $30 versus $300. So the same concept still applies. The, the arbitrage profits will be a little less, and it'll be more of a hassle to actually do the transaction. But nevertheless, it'll hold. So let me give you a more concrete example of an arbitrage situation or the lack thereof. And so we're going to use Toyota Motor Company as an example. Their stock. Now, their stock trades on the New York Stock Exchange, trades in Germany and Frankfurt, and trades in Tokyo because it's a Japanese company. And so the interesting thing is when you buy Toyota in, in the U.S., you buy it through what's called an ADR, an American Depository Receipt, and you actually get two shares. When you buy Toyota in this country, you just go to buy shares. You won't even realize it, but you're actually buying two shares for $76 at this point in time. So I did this analysis a while back. And at the time, if you wanted to buy Toyota in this country, you'd buy it on the New York Stock Exchange for $7, $76.60. You're effectively buying two shares. So we need I need to make an adjustment and divide it by two to get this analysis to work, to get it on a per share basis from a Japanese perspective. Now, if you bought it in Frankfurt, it would cost you 30, 30 euros, 30.8 euros. And if you bought it in Tokyo, it would cost you 3,580 yen. So those are the prices around the world. And now what we need to do is we need to adjust things for exchange rates because we want to get everything in the same currency. In this case, since we're Americans, let's put everything in dollars. So when you buy one share, Toyota, it's going to be $38.30 per share. When you look at the Frankfurt stock, the price is going to actually cost you, ignoring commissions and so forth, taxes, it's going to cost you $38.19 with an exchange rate of $1.24 dollars per euro. Dollars per euro. And then when we, so that's the exchange rate adjustment. And then the exchange rate adjustment for the yen, the yen happened to be $1 was equal to 116.2 yen. So we multiply this out, the inverse of it, we get a price of $38.31. Now, I consider this to be highly successful, meaning that the markets basically have no arbitrage opportunities. I was really close with the New York Stock Exchange and the Tokyo Exchange, and I was bit a little off by a few cents with Frankfurt. Keep in mind that when you do these arbitrage situations, if you really want it to be risk-free, you need to buy and sell. You'd buy in the cheap market, in which case you'd buy in Frankfurt in this case and sell in Tokyo. But you need to do it simultaneously because if you have a delay from the time you buy it to the time you sell it, then you have an investment for whatever, however many seconds that you hold that security for, or however minutes you hold that position for, you have a position nevertheless, and so you have an investment that's at risk. But when you do arbitrage, you want to instantaneously buy it in one market, for example, Frankfurt for $38.19, and sell it in Tokyo immediately for a 12 cent profit per share. But I consider myself really lucky to have done this uh, one day because, look, I'm sitting in my computer in Maine 
figuring out, well, what's the, what was the price at a point in time? And these sh prices did not line up exactly at the same time. Because, you know, Tokyo's closed much of the time the New York Stock Exchange is open and so on. So, you know, you could have a stale price very easily. Or if the market's quite volatile, this can fall apart if you're trying to do it by hand here. But nevertheless, the markets were relatively stable, and I consider this to be rel relatively successful. And the point being, if you did this simultaneously, buying and selling, buy what's cheap and sell what's expensive, then there shouldn't be any profits or any significant profits once you adjust for the various commissions that you're going to have to pay. And what are the commissions? Well, you're going to pay a stock commission and you're going to pay a commission or a spread in the exchange rates. So now is maybe a good time to talk about spreads. So whenever you buy a stock or currency or a bond, there's a spread because you have a dealer that deals with bonds, that deals with exchange rates and deals with stock. They buy low and sell high. And the difference between their prices is what's called a spread. That's how they make money. Just like a car dealer. Car dealer earns a spread. They buy a car cheap and sell it for a little bit more. And so car dealers are just like security dealers in, in a sense. Now, let's do another example. It's a little more ex abstract, but nevertheless, it'll be helpful in thinking about arbitrage opportunities and how to price one security against another. And so here we have a situation. There's two possible states of the stock market. The stock market can go up or it can go down. And you have stock A and B. So here we are right here at this point. Stock market can go up. And if the stock market goes up, stock A is worth $70. And if stock market goes up, B is worth $35. If the stock market goes down, A is worth $30 and B is worth $15. And it turns out that the price of A today is, or right now at least, is $50. And so now the question becomes, what's the price of B? And so look, this, this scenario is rather confined. The market can go either up or down. And then here are the what we call the payoffs of the stock. So that's the payoffs. What is B? Well, it's an easy comparison of A and B because look what happens. If the market goes up, A's payoff is twice B. The market goes down, A's payoff is twice of B. Therefore, the price of A has to be double the price of B. So B has to be worth $25 per share. Okay. So that's rather intuitive, and all we're doing is we're pricing A and B off of each other based on their payoffs. Now what we want to do is let's go a little further and do some little heavier analysis using some tables. And what we're going to assume is that you can take a $150 position in A, and you can take a $150 position in B. And when I say position, that means you can go long A or B, $150 or you can short A or B for $150. That's what I mean by take a position. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go long some stock and we're going to short some stock and we're going to look at the cost and compare the up and down payoffs. So let's assume that we buy. So remember, it's $150 is the positions that we have we can take in each stock. So let's go long. And I'm going to assume that we're going to go long 3A. So three shares, that's three shares of A. Because we have $150, and three times 50 is going to be $150. So that's, that's our position in A. We're going to go long. And then we're going to have the cash flow associated with A. And we're going to pay $150. Oops, $150 when we do that. And we need to look at what happens if the market goes down. And what happens if the market goes up? What's the value of, what is the, the payoff here? Well, if it goes down, A is going to be worth 30 times 3. It's going to be worth $90, that position. So it's 3 shares times the 30 gives you 90. And if the market goes up, it's going to be 3 times 70 or 210. Okay, so that's how much the payoffs will be. Now, what if we short stock B? Well, stock B 
is worth half. So we're going to take a position of 6 B, because six times the 25 will give us $150, okay? So we took a position, and when we short it, we're going to collect $150. So you notice that. So we have a zero investment now. So add that up, zero, because we went long shares, we went short shares, and the same dollar amount, the cost is zero. So no investment. Now, if we're in an arbitrage free market and there's no profits, then no matter what happens, it goes up and down, we should have zeros here also. Because we made a zero investment, we should make zero profits. Let's see. Well, if we take B, stock B, and the stock goes down to 15, so six shares times 15 is going to be minus 90. We're going to have to buy the shares back. So you notice this. We sold the shares and we got positive cash flow. Now we're buying the shares back for 90. And so here we have a zero payoff. So no matter what happens here, we're going to have zero for a downside. So if the market goes down, we end up with no profit with this double position. And then on the upside here, we have 210. Now, what is going to be the value if the market goes up? Well, it's 35 times 6. It's going to be 210. We're going to have to buy the shares back for 210. Well, 210 offsets 210, so we have a payoff of zero. Zero cost, zero profits. There's no arbitrage opportunities to be had. This market is properly priced according to the situation. So now let's take the analysis one step further and say, well, what happens if B is mispriced? So let's say B, the price of B today is $30. It's not the 25 that causes a no arbitrage profit. It's mispriced. And as soon as you hear that there's a mispriced security, that means there's an opportunity to make some profit. And so let's see if we can devise a just situation that takes advantage of this. And by the way, this is hard to come up with, you know, how many shares to buy and do this payoff structure. Now, I, I wouldn't ask you a specific question like that on a test because it would be hard for you to come up with this. I could give you scenarios and ask you to calculate the price of B, you know, like give you this scenario, calculate the price of B, and that would be pretty straightforward. But to come up with this analysis takes a lot more time. And so it's not likely to be on a test or a quiz. Now that said, if I was to give you, you go long 3A and you short 6B, you ought to be able to fill out the table that I'm showing you. But coming up with the 3A and 6B, that's, that's really the, the hard part. Now let's get back to the problem at hand. So here we're going to go long 3A because remember we still have $150 to take a position in each stock and the cash flow here is going to be minus 150 and if the market goes down it goes up it's still the 90 and 210 that we end up with positive because we're going to if we bought it we're going to sell it and that's the payoffs but now we're going to go short and we got to go short these shares but they're worth 30 dollars for b so we can only short five of them because 30 times five shares will get us 150 dollars and if we do that, we'll get $150 that we short. So the cost is zero. The net cost of this, these two positions is zero. And then what happens is five times the 15 will get us 75. We're going to have to buy the stock back for 75. We could make $15 on this situation if, if the market goes down. If it goes down, we can make $15. And if the market goes up, Five times the 35 will get us 175. We could make $35. So here we have zero investment with an expected profit. Boy, that's like a money machine. You don't have to put any money down, no money down. So you you got you can take a giant position in this theoretically. And then you have nothing but positive cash flows. That's a money machine. That shouldn't exist in an efficient market if securities are properly priced. And so this situation shouldn't happen. And eventually what will happen is people will be selling B 
push its price down and buying A, and then in doing that, the price, is, the price will eventually converge to $25. And so the expected profit here, you basically, if you expect 50-50, the market goes up or the market goes down 50-50, then you expect to make $25 on this transaction. And why 25? Well, B is mispriced. It's five shares are mispriced by $5. So five times five is the 25 expected profit. So now what we want to do is we want to move on to repurchase agreements, generally called repos. And repos are important because not so much that we're going to look at repurchase agreement transactions, although I'm going to describe one in a minute, is that we want to know where does that R come from? There's this interest rate that we're going to be using to discount the cash flows. Like when we get into a swap and we get into futures contracts, and we even use it to value options. We're going to be discounting future cash flows at this rate R. And this rate R looks a lot and is approximately equal to RRF, the T-bill rate, the risk-free interest rate. They're really close. They're not going to be identical, but for our purposes, it's this repo rate that we're going to use because the repo rate is the cost of money to security dealers. In other words, it's the marginal cost of borrowing and lending for a dealer. And that's what I want to talk about next. What do you mean by repos? Why do security dealers pay this rate of R? How does it work? So this is where the textbook falls down and doesn't give you a good background on why there's a repo market and why it exists and why security dealers have, have it as an opportunity cost of money, R. So let's dig into it. So now let's start off with the motivation for repos and the repurchase agreement market. Why does that happen? Well, derivatives dealers and security dealers, financial institutions, they're continuously buying and selling securities. So if you're a security dealer, for example, let's make it more concrete. Let's say they, it's a security dealer in stocks for the moment. It'll just make it more concrete and help us wrap our heads around the scenario. So if you're a security dealer in a stock, you're standing ready to buy and sell the stock. And so here is the balance sheet of the dealer. And the dealer is going to be posting bid and ask prices. And it could be, you know, that the, the, the bid price is $99. The dealer will pay $99 for the share of stock and it'll sell it at $100. And so what this means is, look, the dealer will buy the shares at 99 and is willing to sell at 100 It posts its prices. This is what it advertises on the internet and in the market. So it makes a dollar profit round trip. So if it buys shares and then sells it to you for 100 it's going to make a dollar profit. Now, every security has a bid and an ask price. Even currencies have bid and ask prices. Futures, options, stocks, and bonds all have a bid and an ask price. Technically, even a car dealer has a bid price and an asking price, and they make a spread of a profit. Now, you don't often see the spreads, and you don't know that there's a bid and ask price frequently because what you'll see on the Internet is you'll see one of two things. You'll see either the last transaction that a dealer makes being posted. So the last transaction is dealer sold shares, then it would be for $100 is the price you'd see advertised on the, web, on the web. Not advertised, but disclosed on the web as the latest price. Now, if the dealer purchased the shares in its last transaction, the price you'd see is 99 Now, this is obviously well exaggerated. The difference is often just a few pennies. So dealers have to re rely on continuously buying and selling to make a few pennies per share. And so in order to be profitable and make a living, they got to do this thousands of times a day. But in any case, the last transaction is what the price is going to get recorded at in the financial markets. Or it could be the alternative to that is some, some financial uh, papers and newspapers and organizations that list prices will cut it right down the middle. They'll see the bid and the ask price and they'll cut it right down the middle. The price is $99.50. But in any case, you got a dealer and the dealer is going to, for example, if the dealer has to buy at 99, it's going to put an asset on its books, the stock. 
So it's an asset for $99, okay? So that's, you know, remember, this is a balance sheet, this is assets, this is liabilities. But where does it get the funding for this $99? It's not like the dealer is going to sit on cash and, and then just pay $99 because if the dealer sits on cash, the dealer is losing out on the opportunity to cost the money and spreads are really thin. This is paper thin. These will be penny differences here. This dealer can't afford to have money sitting in an account to pay for this stock. And by the way, the dealer never knows whether they're going to be buying and selling, and they're going to be doing this a thousand times a day. So as soon as they take a position in a stock, there's this big hole right here. You know what that hole is? That hole is they need funding to buy these shares of stock. And I'm just doing it for one share. Normally when a dealer posts bid and ask prices, it's not unlimited and it's not for one share. It'll often be maybe it's a thousand shares. Oops, not dollar signs, but a thousand shares here that they agree to buy or sell, buy or sell. Could be 500, depending on the stock and the situation. So keep in mind, it's not one share, but I'm doing things on a one share basis so we don't have to multiply things by a thousand. Driver sells crazy. So the dealer buys these shares because somebody took, took up the bid here that the dealer posted and the dealer buys it for 99, they gotta finance it. That's what this hole is. The hole is financing it. They gotta come up with the money for that. And how do you do that? Well, that's where the repo market comes in. As soon as the dealer takes possession or, or transacts, I should say, and buys this share, it's gotta borrow money in the repo market to pay for it. You know, it's, it's just the way the markets are set up for that. So you might think, oh, oh man, how do you do that? And but the dealer is doing this thousands of times a day. It's like you going to the supermarket and paying with a credit card. Well, the supermarket and every supermarket around the country is set up to take a credit card. So it's just ordinary business. Well, the repo market is just ordinary business for security dealers. So people are ready for it. It's designed to do this. It's designed to help finance dealers situations. Now, if the reverse happens and the dealer happens to sell a hundred uh, shares for a hundred dollars, then it's going to have cash of a hundred dollars that it needs to get rid of. And then it can lend money in the repo market. So the repo market is for people, I should say security dealers that borrow and lend depending on whether the dealer is taking a position in the stock or selling the stock. So if it sells the stock, gets $100, it's going to have $100 in cash. It doesn't want to sit on $100 in cash. It wants to earn something. So it'll go in the repo market and lend it out and earn a rate of return overnight. So now what I want to do is let's look at the mechanics of a repurchase agreement. So before we go further, now before we even go any further, let's, let's just make sure we're, we're on top of this. We're looking at repos and the interest rate associated with this borrowing and lending, depending on whether the dealer bought or sold, because this is the opportunity cost of money from a dealer's perspective. So when we're looking at valuing and pricing options, futures, and swaps, the appropriate interest rate to discount things by is this R, this repo rate, which is closely related to the risk-free rate. And that's what I'm about to explain. Why are these two so close? And what are the mechanics? How does it op actually operate? So here's how it works. When you enter into a repo transaction, there's going to be two legs. And there's a leg that happens on day one, and there's a leg that happens on day two. So repurchase agreements and transactions often happen one day, and then they reverse, which is why it's called a repurchase, the next day. So you enter into a transaction on day one with a counterparty, and then you, at this day, you know you're going to reverse it the next day. So repos are often what we call overnight transactions. There's a lot of securities settle overnight, and so you borrow money overnight to help finance the security dealer's position. And so that's why overnight these things happen. Now, they can happen on seven-day basis, and they're sometimes called term repos. could be 30 days, but it's often overnight borrowing and lending that's going on. So now let's model both counterparties. So here you have a dealer that needs money. 
In other words, they want to borrow. So they're going to be borrowing money. And so this is one dealer. And now you have a dealer here that has excess money. In other words, it has money to lend. So there you have it right there. That's how you make a market. One has excess, one has some needs, they meet and they're going to transact. And so here we have a dealer that needs money to pay for a security that it just bought. So, you know, in the previous example, they bought a security for, for $99. They need to borrow the money to finance it. And so in day one, they have a security, but they need to borrow the money to pay for it. So what they're going to do is they're going to use the security that they bought. And there's, let's say it's a T-bill. And they're going to send the T-bill over to the dealer with excess dollars. And the dealer is going to send money over in this direction. So this is the security for the transaction. It's as though this dealer, or this dealer, I should say, purchased the treasury bill and then sold it instantly over to this dealer. But really what's happening is they've entered into an agreement on day one to borrow money. This dealer's borrowing the money. This dealer's lending it. And T, a T-bill is collateral. So this T-bill is collateral. So now right away, you see this is sometimes called a secured transaction. It's secured by collateral. And it's a risk-free security that's the collateral, which is why the R is a good, the repo rate is a good approximation for the risk-free T-bill rate because of this situation. Now this T-bill is gonna go off. It won't technically go to this dealer. It'll go to, to the dealer's bank. So there's a bank's involved in this transaction. It's just a simplified way of modeling this transaction. It's more complicated as banks involved and so forth. But the money goes, the money goes in this direction. The T-bill goes over to the right. And that's the first leg. Then the next day, the second leg, this unwinds. And it's as though the T-bill gets repurchased. So here the T-bill goes back, the collateral, because this is going to what's called unwind. They're going to unwind the transaction. And the next day, the money is going to go back to this dealer plus a percent for interest. You know, because this, this dealer is borrowing money overnight, they're going to have to pay a small interest rate. So it's going to be the interest rate divided by 365 days, 365. So whatever the interest rate is, it's going to be 1 365th of that interest rate. Because remember, interest rates are always disclosed on an annual basis. So you're going to take, say, 2% and divide it by 365. That's the daily interest rate. And so that's the transaction. You enter in, and this dealer is going to sell its T-bill on day one and repurchase it the next day. And so it's like a repurchase, and it's kind of like a borrowing and lending at the same time. So that's the confusing part to some people. It's, it's both a borrowing and a lending, and it's a sale and a repurchase. So that's how the security markets worth, work with respect to repo. So that's the underlying rationale. So now you have a motivation for why the repo market exists. Mechanically, this is how the repo market works. And now you can see, since the collateral is often a treasury bill or something really low risk, the risk-free rate is a good approximation. The risk-free rate here is a good approximation for this repo rate. So this right here, this is the repo rate, R percent. And if now keep in mind that the repo market is huge. There's lots of different securities that are involved in the repo market. So there's lots of different interest rates, repo rates, not just one that approximates the risk-free rate. So the textbook argues that you know, like I've been saying, that the risk-free rate and the repo rate are about the same. And that certainly applies when, when we're looking at a T-bill used as collateral. But what about when it's for stocks or for other securities? Well, in those cases, then the, the repo transaction is often over-collateralized. So if they're borrowing $100, maybe they'll put up $110 worth of securities to back it up. So it's heavily collateralized, and that reduces the risk of the transaction substantially. And, and so it gives us some support and reason for why the textbook and the derivatives market often uses the repo rate as the marginal cost of funds.